Okay, welcome back, and let's fend off the attackers. Let's see, in last time's episode, what, what happened? Oh yeah, we didn't get to see the intro because Newbie hates the intro for some reason. And three gargoyles came through the gate, and we're going to whoop their asses. Let's take a look at what we got equipped. Hero, that's that's our hero, has a sword. Woo -hoo. And the duper scoopers got a shield and a sword. Yeah, duper! And Shimino's got a sword and a main, main, what is that thing called, main, main gauche, main gosh, yeah, I don't have any idea how to pronounce it, but it's a little, it's a little hand dagger, so he's got a sword and a hand dagger, poke, 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 and Yellow, of course, has his trusty crossbow. Alright, well, let's, let's deal with these guys, we are already in combat mode, so, let's block, and you'll notice that Yolo just shot Shimino in the back. So the AI is working properly. Everything is is fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Mm -hmm. Haven't managed to land a hit yet. Oh, that's not. Hmm. Well, that guy's dead. That guy's dead. Notice the uh, the occupants of the throne room are are quite helpful in this battle. All right, break off combat. Gotta gather up this crap because that's that's what I do. Uh, yellow, you're first. Oh, how much you got, yellow? You got you ain't got a whole lot of carrying capacity, do you, buddy? Hmm. All right, yellow, get out of here. Go stay in the corner. Shimino, how you, oh yeah, Shimino's doing great. 15 out of 42. Let's pick up some throwing axes. That's how I'm just walking around, picking stuff up off the ground. That's that's what we do. Always the smart ones, that's what they do. Uh, yeah, it's good over now. Stand over there. Duper, you're up. What do you got for me, buddy? All right, so now we got bodies. Let's move the bodies. Let's, uh, oh no, we got we got one of them there. Throwing axes. Move to the right or left, down. Move to the left, left. Move to the left, left. Move to the left, up. Move to the up, left. The reason I'm saying that's because that's the direction I'm I'm uh, pressing. See, first you have to tell it where you want to move. So in this case, I'm moving the left object, and now I have to tell it where. See how it says move dead body too? That's the where. So I'm moving it that way. Yeah. I can't do anything about the blood on the carpets, but that's okay. I'm sure you have a wonderful cleaning crew that can handle that for you there, British. Alright, so searching the body, you just look at the body. We find a wooden shield, a leather helm, a boomerang, and a club. Let's pick that up. Duper, you're up. Oops. Look there. Oh my gosh, throwing axes. Now you're probably wondering why I'm picking up all this crap. So I can sell it, of course. You think I'm going to just go out and earn money honestly? Screw that, I'm going to be killing stuff. Sell this crap. Now the trick with, with Ultima is figuring out where you can sell what. Not every weapon shop will buy every weapon. They only sell the stuff, or they only buy the stuff that they sell. So if you want to sell a sword, you have to find someone who actually sells swords, and then you go sell it to them. If you want to sell a throwing axe, you got to find someone who sells throwing axes, and they will buy them for you, from you, something, whatever. All right, Duper, uh, we got some boomerangs? Cool. Throw the boomerangs down right there, and throw down a helmet. Now back to Hero. Hero, pick up the helmet, pick up the two boomerangs. Now you're probably wondering why am I doing that. Simple, I'm going to put on the helmet, take off the sword, and now I am a ranged specialist. I got two boomerangs. Nothing messes with me. YOLO, my main man. Hmm. Wait, Duper, do you, you got any more boomerangs? You got one boomerang. Hmm. I guess you can hang on to it for now. All right, back into party mode. The difference between solo mode and party mode is party mode, when I move, everyone follows me. In solo mode, like for example, I'm Dupre. Check him out. 
because no one's following him. And if I put hero in solo mode, it's very helpful when you want to have one person do all this stuff and not have everyone getting in your way and stuff. Even in combat, they'll get in your way. It's annoying. Alright, so we're not going to do much now. We're just going to clear out the, the throne room. This is one of those games where it's like I can just be playing it and not realize that how much time has passed. And next thing you know, I've got like a 15 hour video because holy crap, I just went through the entire game. Oops. Yeah, so we're going to have to set goals. We're going to have to set limits. So for now, let's just figure out what's going on. It's been five seasons since I left Britannia. Now keep in mind, the time does not flow evenly. If it's been five seasons on Earth, it doesn't mean it's been five seasons on Britannia. At one point it's been like, you know, two weeks on Earth and 3,000 years have passed and no one knows how, any idea who I am. They're like, who, who the hell is this guy? I'm, I'm the Avatar. Pfft, bullshit, you're not the Avatar. He's like, oh, okay, anyways. So we're gonna talk to British. We got from you, British. Now we get to go through the uh, copy protection. I do not have my manual anywhere near me. In fact, I don't actually even have my manual anymore because my original copy of Ultima 6, which was the original release, burned up when my house burnt down back in the, uh, was it 95, 96? No, somewhere in the mid-90s. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I had to go and repurchase all the old ones, but that's okay because I made up for it with a vengeance. I've got like four copies of every Ultima, except Ultima 9. One copy is enough for anybody, even the most rabid fan, which... That, that's me by definition. Even the most rabid fan couldn't stomach more than one copy of that. But, uh, yeah, let's, we're going to go off of memory. All right, so that's Lord British. See, there's his little portrait, and there's his little character sheet. He's got a necklace and two rings and some boots. He's apparently not wearing any clothes. Obviously, he's wearing clothes, but you know what I mean. All right, so let's see what we got here. Oh, I thought I hit T. I must have hit L. Well, here. There. You see the noble ruler of Britannia. I'll sum up. We're not going to read verbatim everything they say. All right, so he's all like, hey, a lot of stuff has happened, but first I must make sure it's truly you. This is copy protection. We had to do this in the old days. They'd give us manuals and be like, turn to page 47. On the third paragraph, the sixth word in of the second sentence is what? And you'd have to look in your manual and be like, oh, it's purple. And sometimes the pages would have funky colors in the background so that you couldn't actually just photocopy the pages because that was copy protection. But, eh. This one just asks you questions. Alright. Only the true avatar would know what was contained in the compendium I sent. You didn't send a compendium. The gargoyles sent a portal. And I stupidly stepped through it. But was it so stupid? Hmm. Yeah, let's just think about that. Anyways. Ask me your questions, Bridge Keeper. I'm not afraid. What part of the Tangle Vine doth put one to sleep? As I recall, that was the pod. Correct. Boom, that's one. How doth giant squids crush their pe prey? I believe that was the beak. Boom, two. Oh, I'm awesome. What creatures are wisps oft mistaken for? Oh, that's easy. Fireflies. Boom, ding, 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 and you win a brand new key. Here, have a key. Okay. All right, it unlocks the gatehouse at the southern entrance of the castle and also the sewers. Cool, that's convenience in a little package. All right, so now he's gonna tell me what happened since last time I was here. All right, so the underworld from which I rescued him collapsed and evil forces are still abroad in the land. Oh, <gasps> say it isn't so. Britannia is under attack by gargoyles, like the ones we just fought. Hey, convenient. They've been coming up through the dungeons. Thus far, they've been attacking the Shrine to the Eight Virtues. Uh, when the Shrine of Compassion fell, Jeffrey sent a party to free it. Um, talk to him about it. Um, uh -huh. And while you're here, you got a room in the castle. Uh, you can borrow anything you want. It's next to his room. Um, it's got gear inside the room right, waiting for you, but again, you can borrow anything in the castle. Uh, oh, and yeah, he gives you healing for free because he's cool. In fact, old chap, why don't you heal me now? Boom, and I'm healed. Yay! It's the only useful thing you've ever done in your entire life. Yeah, cool. The one time he actually, actually, that's not true. There are two times when he breaks his pattern of just sitting on his ass and not doing anything. The first time was in the last Ultima, Ultima 5, when he decided since I wasn't here, he was going to go on an adventure and got his ass captured. Hence the whole the underworld collapse and I had to rescue him from it, blah, blah, blah. And the next time, which is going to be Ultima 9, which we don't really want to talk about. 
It's kind of like you know the, the first rule is you don't talk about Fight Club. Well, you don't talk about Ultima Nine. Just you don't want to talk about. It. But we're going to talk about it for a moment because it had an amazing soundtrack. And no, this is not the soundtrack of Ultima Nine playing. This is actually the soundtrack to the Ultima Five um, Lazarus mod for Dungeon Siege. Which, while I don't really like Dungeon Siege and I I despise the engine, it was still an amazing mod and thumbs up, kudos guys, you rocked, you rocked. Um, where was I? Oh, yes, <clears throat> yeah, he, uh, he does something in Ultimate 9, and for the one, for the, for the one time he shines, or British shines, he goes out and he kicks ass. Um, let's talk about Ultima 4, and but let's actually, let's, let's talk about Ultima in general, so you have some idea of what's going on. Ultima 1, 2, and 3, again, it was Richard Garriott teaching himself how to program, they weren't originally intended to tell a story, I mean, each game told its own little story, but then it was like one day he was looking at it, he's like, hey, you know, they're kind of related. Cool, got a trilogy. And then he started doing four, five, and six. So it's a trilogy of trilogies. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And eventually he went back and kind of wove it into a story haphazardly. There are glaring discrepancies, but I can forgive them because it was one of those, eh, it's kind of a story. Let's, why don't we just build it as one? as opposed to stuff like Metal Gear where it's like, okay, this is going to be a total story, but I have absolutely no skill in the art of planning ahead, so I'm going to tell you stuff, and then in the very next installment, I'm going to completely retcon everything. Retconning is when you go back and decide that that's not really how it happened. Let's change it. You know, like the whole Yoda, the Jedi Master who instructed me, and then you watch the prequels, and Yoda had nothing to do with Obi-Wan's training. It was all Qui-Gon. So, yeah, you know, that, that's retconning. I have no respect for retconning because, I mean, sometimes it's necessary, but when your entire series is based upon it, you probably shouldn't be telling stories, dude, because you suck at it. Sorry. You know, it's just how it is. Anyhow, the point being, in 1, 2, and 3, there was a great evil in the land, and Britannia was not Britannia. It was a world called Caesarea. British is originally from Earth. One day he was walking, and he found that sexy little necklace he's got. See this thing right here? And when he picked it up, a gate popped up, kind of like you know, the, the red one that we stepped through on. This one was blue. And he was like, oh, look at me. Yeah. And he stepped through, and the first person he ran into was Shimino, who was chopping wood. And as I recall the story, um, he looked up and saw a dude just appear out of nowhere. And so instead of chopping the wood, the axe bounced off the wood and gathered gashed his leg and like British was like oh shit dude you okay and ran over to him and the guy's just like eh waved him off and did a heal spell and cured it that's the sound effect from Ultima 5 he did that whenever he cast a spell go and then so there you go it's Ultima 5 sound effect heard it here first yay me anyhow and, and Shimina healed his leg and British was all like the fuck did you just do and Shimino starts babbling at him, and strangely, British could understand him, and so like they became good buds. And of course, the very first person that British sees is Shimino because, well, you know, they're both the same person. Because remember, Richard Gary is Lord British and Shimino. It's kind of like he, he put himself in the game twice, so yeah. So they met themselves, and they're like, hey, how's it going, buddy? And then British goes out and he does all sorts of cool stuff, and he's like this big badass and stuff, and he unified a lot of people and formed his own little kingdom, and everything was cool. But he was one of, like, eight kings, I think it was? Eight kings and queens? Yeah, I think each of the four, because there was like four lands. It, again, it's 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 kind of haphazard here, so just kind of bear with me. But the world consisted of four lands. But eventually, when the great evil was destroyed, that world got split into four worlds. But I guess they're kind of small, considering that each one is a quarter of the world. But anyhow, each of the lands had two kings or queens. Actually, I actually can't remember if there were any queens or not. But we'll just pretend that there were. I don't know. But yeah, there was this evil wizard, and he was like this total badass. He was like, yeah, but he was an asshole. And even his own dad was like, dude, you're an asshole. You know what? You gotta clean up your act. So I'm shipping your ass off to a monastery, and if you can actually handle it, then when you get back, I'm gonna give you this cool sun ruby, which contains the power of the sun. I don't know why he felt the need to explain that. I mean, it's called the sun ruby. You'd think he, you know, can just kind of assume that it has something to do with the sun. But anyways, it's like, yeah, that's really cool. So this dude, let's let's call him Mondane for was his name. He that night he like murdered his dad. His dad's name was Wolfgang, not that it matters. He has a brother too, an older brother, but they never told us anything about him. He just like left. So it's a shame, we never knew anything about Wolfgang's eldest son. So yeah, Mondane kills him and takes the gem for his own and like twists it to evil and it turns into the, the black gem of immortality. But although it wasn't originally immortality, but he eventually turned it into immortality and poured so much of himself into it that he couldn't die as long as the gem was still around. 
and he like mastered the the art of talking to the Imperial Navy because yes in Ultima 1 you had to go into space and fight TIE fighters he was teaching himself how to program so shut up I can hear you criticizing it you know what let's see you go become the father of RPGs yeah there you go yeah anyhow the point being he went out and did all the cool stuff and formed his little kingdom and everything and everyone's having trouble with this mundane guy because he was kicking everyone's ass and so they called me up one day on the phone and the British was all like yo Ice Cube. I was like, yeah. He's like, how you doing? I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of pissed off. What do you want? And he was all like, uh, could, could you come to Cesaria and kick this guy's ass? Um, he, he, he called you a chump. And I was like, I am on my way. So I just jumped right in. I was like, where is he? Where is he? They had to hold me back. They had to restrain me because I was just, I was chomping at the bit. No one calls me a chump gets away with it except me. And even then, it's, it's, it's not, you know, I wouldn't lay odds. So I was all like, I went after him, and I slapped him a couple times. And I was like, dude, dude, I'm slapping you, and it's not doing nothing. What, what the hell? And he was all like, you can't hurt me because I got this gym. Ha, 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 ha. But by then, it, the gym was so powerful that no one could destroy it. So I was like, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, I saw this movie where this guy went back in time and, like, totally had this relationship with his mom. And he made, like, a tree, and he got out of there. So that's what I'm going to do. So I went, and I found this time machine. And I was like, yo, H.G. Wells. And he was like, what, where's that time machine at? I need to go back in time. So I jumped onto it, and I went back in time, and everything was cool. I found Mondane's little fortress, and I walked up there, and he was like, what you going to do? And I was like, punch that gym. I punched that gym. I was like, bam. And that gym exploded, and it hurt. I still got scars. Still got scars. That thing hurt. But then I went over there, and I kicked Mondane's ass. I mean, I kicked his ass. His ass was kicked. All right, remember, remember that Lord of the Rings movie where they like threw the ring into the lava and it like blew the eye up and all that stuff? Yeah, it was, it was, it was more of a thorough ass kick in than that. It was like, whoa. So that happened. And then in part two, like it turned out that Mondane had an apprentice and her name was, was it's either Minax or Minax. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's one of the two. I believe it was Latin for like, what was it for? Ominous? Or foreboding or something to that general effect? Anyways, he had an apprentice. She, she was his child lover thing. Now, they never really clarify what child lover meant like how much of a child but uh you know considering this was way back when when reading about pedophilia on on facebook wasn't like an everyday occurrence so i'm i'm gonna guess she was probably like in her teens somewhere anyways she, she they were doing stuff and things were were pretty were pretty racy but for some reason she never showed up when i kicked his ass i don't know maybe she was out shopping for something i don't know but then suddenly she shows up and she's like oh hell no and so she decides to get revenge, but this one had nothing to do with Cesaria. She like actually took the fight to Earth. She came looking for me, and apparently she was pretty good at it because she like pissed all the nations off until they start launching nukes at each other, and we nuked ourselves back into the Stone Age. But she fiddled with time gates, and she did it so much that I was able to escape by going back in time and being like, okay, okay, gotta lay the law down. So I went, I laid the law down. And I, went way back in time to the time of legends where she was hiding with her army of of demons she had an army of demons i don't know why she just had an army of demons and so i went up there and i had to slap her around but i couldn't just slap her around i had to use a special sword called enilno the quick sword the quick blade i'm sorry that's where i met sean trey sean trey's a pretty cool dude he was in jail in santa fe i think it was was it in santa fe oh well, anyways, he was in jail somewhere, and he was all like, hey, bust me out of jail, and I'll sell you my sword. It's like, dude, you, you won't even give me the sword? You're, you're going to sell it to me? Okay. But, you know, they generally do take your wallet from you when you're in jail, so I guess he didn't have any money, and so he needed to make some cash. Anyways, I bought the sword from him, went back, and I, you know, stabbed her a couple times, and yeah, I, she hasn't recovered yet. So then after that, it turns out that they had a love child, but they didn't actually have a love child. It turns out that they were, like, software engineers. I would have thought wizards and software engineers and they made a giant computer and it took punch cards and so I took the punch and I well I put the punch into punch cards if you know what I mean and I blew it up and that was when Britannia decided to become not Cesaria they said you know what we're not going to be Cesaria anymore because Cesaria is lame it's a pretty Cesaria state of affairs ha <laughs> ha yeah that was pretty good right and yeah they named themselves Britannia so then they decided they didn't have any more bad guys to fight so they wanted me to like go like become this great pinnacle of virtue because it's impossible no one can do it and I was like it's not impossible he said well as I want press my T16 back home they're not much bigger than the shrines of the great virtues and so I went out and I proved it and that's what I did I went out and I was like, like tell us about the eight virtues and I said okay we have three three pr 
principles that control the virtues. We have truth, love, and courage. Now, when you take them by themselves, truth becomes honesty, courage becomes valor, and um, love becomes compassion. But when you mix them around, kind of like we did with those little, um, you know, Kool-Aid vials that we were playing with, huh? you getting the connection here? Yeah, you mix them up and you get other stuff. Like, you know, you get the, you put the blue with the yellow and you get some green, that's justice. So you get truth and, and love form justice, and if you get uh, truth and, and courage, they form purple, which is the color of honor, you see how it works, and then if you mix all three of them together, you get spirituality, but then humility is black, where does that come from? That one's kind of a little bit of a story, but boiling it down, it turns out that pride is like, you know, not a, is not a virtue, which I disagree with. I don't think that pride is the anti-virtue that they say it is. I think they meant to say arrogance, because when you do something that's difficult to do and you finally achieve doing so you know it's like it's your goal I want to do this it's, I'm Hercules and I got these 12 tasks it's only natural to feel a little bit of pride in actually pulling it off but there's a difference between hey dude look what I did I'm awesome to hey dude look what I did that none of your lame asses can ever possibly do because I'm so much more better than you there's a little difference there that's arrogance so I think arrogance is actually what they meant so I'm not going to say pride I'm going to say arrogance but anyways you flip arrogance around you get humility so when you get down to it it's like humility is kind of like the the, uh, the glue that binds them all together because it doesn't have anything to do with the others but at the same time it does it's like you know once you've, once you've mastered the others you, you should have by now begin to understand the concept of humility which is funny because most ultimate fans think that humility is like the worst virtue so it's like yeah it's like you play this game about mastering the virtues but yet you clearly don't really understand the virtues because humility is kind of the most important virtue you know, it's understanding your place in the in the grand scheme of things, not thinking that you're inherently better than anyone else, or inherently worse. You're like, you know, we're we're all a part of the big thing. We're all part of the universe, that sort of thing. So yeah, we got all that stuff. Um, so those are the virtues. I had to go espouse the virtues and become the living symbol of them. So here I am. Ultima Five was, you know, well, like I said, he decided to go out on a little adventure because I found the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. That's that book I mentioned that you know, whenever you ask a question, you go look at the Codex, and the Codex already knows what the question is, and it's turned to the answer for you. So you just got to read the book, and they'll tell you. And let me tell you, that is a bunch of bullshit, all right? I had that book with me throughout college, and I still had to study because that book didn't know what the hell it was talking about. Didn't know what the hell it was talking about. So, yeah, there's that. And Ultima 5, uh, let's see. One of my favorite Ultimas. In fact, if I had to, to, to list them in order, I would probably say 7 in its whole. Because 7 came out as part 1 and part 2. But in its whole, I'd say 7, then 5, then 6. 6 is cool. 6 is cool. But I really like 7. And 5 was just an epic story. Because you had to go find the king. It was basically... 4 was creating this, this system of virtues. The virtues aren't laws. They're just like a, a set of guidelines to live by. Not like an established religion where... Oh... Did you donate to the Shrine of Compassion today? No. Oh, you're going to burn in hell. It wasn't anything like that. It's just one of those things where it's like, if you see someone who's in need, help them. Um, don't keep everything for yourself. You know, that's that's the whole point of sacrifices. It, it goes with compassion again. The courage to, to, to sacrifice to those who are less fortunate. You know, because that's orange, red, and yellow. You see, you know, sacrifice is made up of, of love and, and, and courage. You know, there you go. You're, you're willing to give up a little bit to help others, and you know, that's what that's sacrifice is all about. Stuff like that. So, anyways, um, you know, that one set up the whole scheme of live by these these virtues, and it'll make things happy and and wonderful. But then, what happens when the virtues be actually become a regulated set of laws? That's what happened in five. British here had the bright idea to go check out this underworld, which had opened up after I found the codex. Now, note, I said I found the codex. I didn't actually recover the codex like everyone seems to think in the later games. That's not what happened. You, sh you found the codex and then the Great Council used magic to transport it, lock, stock, and barrel up to the surface of Britannia and that caused this huge underworld to open up. Now keep in mind this whole underworld thing kind of doesn't make a lick of sense when you factor in later games to it because it's, well, yeah, it, it just it doesn't really make sense but, you know, loose, loose loosely tied together sort of thing. Anyways, I'm um, doing that, and then I got uh, magically thrown right back to Earth because that's what happened, and when Ultima 5 comes along, um, the British is all like, you know what? Let's go Let's go chart the underworld. 
So we got a bunch of dudes. I think it was like eight of them or something like that. And they're like, let's go. Yeah, that's a great idea. Woohoo. Blackthorn, you're in charge, buddy. And so they went down and, yeah, all hell broke loose because monsters attacked, wiped the party out, and grabbed British, who, by the way, is invincible, but they still managed to kick his ass and dragged him off into a dungeon. No one knows what happened to British. Everyone thinks he's dead. I think there was like one survivor. And um, Blackthorn, like I said, he's, he's in charge. He's the regent. He was a good, noble, upstanding man. But then the same creatures that kicked British's ass came and started um, corrupting him to darkness. They were the three shadow lords of hatred, cowardice, and falsehood. Hmm, truth, love, courage. Here, here, see, see little, little, uh, little symbology going on there. A little, little, little have, a, have a little fun there. Concordant opposition, that sort of thing. So yeah, there was these three shadow lords, and they were jerks, and they were like corrupting the government until he started seeing all this evil about and he said you know what we have got to do something so he made them laws so instead of it being just a suggestion hey if you see a, a, a beggar give him a coin it became the, the eight laws of virtue the law of sacrifice thou shalt sacrifice half thy income to charity or thou shalt have no income the law of, of honesty thou shalt tell no falsehood or thou shalt lose thy tongue you know etc 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 et et um yeah, Blackthorn turned into an asshole. Um, everyone, you know, they, again, everyone believed that British was dead. Um, the, the companions of the Avatar, you know, like, like my buds here, they got outlawed. They were declared outlaws and were in hiding. Uh, the Great Council was also, you know, they became fugitives and were in hiding. Uh, Blackthorn moved the seat of Britannia, the, the seat of the, the government from Britannia, or Ca Castle Britannia, to um, uh, the Isle of Turfin, which is. You know, incidentally, where, where you had to toss Mondain's skull into a volcano to seal the abyss. Mm. And yeah, so all this stuff's going down, and, and somehow they were able to get you back to Britannia. Um, they, they minted a coin with the image of the Codex on it, and somehow this coin, like, took me back to Britannia. And as soon as I got there, remember that nice little little uh, picture on the wall of my house with, with me protecting Shamster, the hamster, from the, the big bad Shadow Lords? Yeah, that happened, because he was there waiting for you, and then they showed up. And he was all like, oh, hell no. And they're like, oh, shut up, and bam, and shot him with an arrow. And he was like, oh, I am slain, and fell down. And he's got, like, five hit points when the game starts. And that's it. It's you and... Mr. Five Hit Point Wonder there, and you have to wander through the wasteland of, that is Britannia trying to find where you're supposed to go because this is the first time you've ever played an Ultimate game. You have no idea what the world looks like and don't realize that you're like, you know, five steps away from YOLO's cabin. But I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I'm pissed off. There's a difference. Anyways, then you meet YOLO, and, and he does not look anything like this YOLO. All right? He does not look anything like this YOLO. This, this, is, this is very old YOLO. But the other YOLO looked more like this guy, a little older, a little older. Maybe, maybe, maybe he looked a little more like, like British here. It's about that age, telling you this great story of what all the stuff that's going down. And so, Ultimate Five is the whole thing of, you know, basically trying to figure out what the hell's going on, working outside of the government because you're a fugitive too, even though you're not, but you are. And um, you know, the Shadow Lords are after you. Blackthorn's after you. Blackthorn wants you to, to join his oppression. That's what he calls it. It's like, no, I take that back. They were the, no, yeah, it was the oppression. Um, and then you got, uh, or was it the Inquisition? I think it was the oppression, but it might have been the Inquisition. But in whatever the case, I know there was a high inquisitor in, in, in the town of spirituality, so that's whatever. Anyhow, the point being, you had to rescue this loser from a dungeon. And then afterwards, he banished Blackthorn because he still knew what was going on, sort of. And is like, okay, you did some bad shit, but it wasn't entirely you, so you got a choice. You know, you can stand trial, or I'll just banish you. And he just threw the orb of the, of the moons down on the ground. Is like, this will open a gate to a world that um, you and I have never seen. And Blackthorn was like, yeah, sure, whatever, and jumped through the gate. And then he redeemed himself in Ultima 7 Part 2 because he like lived out his life as a monk and everything. But then later in 9, they wanted to bring him back to the villain. So, oh no, that was a different Blackthorn. Screw you, Origin. Screw you. No, it wasn't. That was Blackthorn. So Ultima 9, and, you know, we don't talk Ultima. So anyways, here we are talking to Lord British. Let's talk to British. Okay. Alright, so he was going to tell us about the gargoyles. So let's see about the gargoyles. Perhaps we can drive them back. Um, all of our evidence have failed. Okay, tell us about the shrines. Okay, the gargoyles may have captured them all by now. Must hurry if they're spoiling the machines. Have the virtues. 
Stay strong in the commitment to the eight virtues. It is our belief in them that sets us apart from the cruel invaders who would destroy all that we hold dear. Okay. Uh, right, I guess we've just about, um, yeah, exhausted the possibilities. For him. Okay, let's talk to Jeffrey. Jeffrey was one of the eight companions. He always espoused the fighter, which is Valor. And Dupre has always been Honor, the Paladin. Yolo, the Bard, is Compassion. The Shamster, the Hamster, there's a Ranger, and Rangers are spiritual, so he was spirituality. Yeah, Mariah is the Mage, Honesty. Jana, the Druid, is Justice. We got Julia, the Tinker, who is um, that sacrifice. And um, am I forgetting anyone? Forget anyone? I don't think so. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Katrina, the, the Shepherdess, is Humility. She has nothing special to offer the group, but again, I think I th she's always been one of my favorite companions because she's got that insight. Although in the later games, she doesn't really have that insight. She's just kind of, she's kind of the useless party member that people label her as because she doesn't really do anything. She's just there. And I was like, aw, she used to have some nice insights. Anyhow, it's a tall, handsome man there. I know because it says right there. That's Jeffrey, and he's going to tell us about his little squad that he sent to save the Shrine of Compassion. So. He sent a party of 10. They failed dismally. Survivors are recuperating in the town of Cove, which is just on the other side of the Shrine of Compassion. Uh, we should go speak to them first. Maybe they learn something. He fears the worst. Gargoyles are really powerful and they're spreading so fast. Perhaps the end of the realm is nigh. Well, to be fair, the gargoyles are incredibly powerful. If we were to rush off to the shrine right now, we would get our asses kicked unless we had just the most amazingly good luck. And it, like, spawned one single one of those guys guarding it. You never know what's going to be there. There could be an entire army waiting for you. There could be an army of the really big ones waiting for you. They're the ones with the wings, and they cast spells, and just, they wreck you. They can wreck you. If it's just these little guys, they're not so bad. Not so bad. We, we can whoop their asses. But... We're not gonna, we're not gonna risk it. We're gonna talk to Nistul, and then we're gonna call it quits for now. We're just getting started. Like I said, I mean, it's already been a half hour, so. But then again, this was kind of like a, a previously on whatever this is called. All right, so we got a mage here. He's concerned looking. We've never met him before. All right. Uh huh. It was I who learned of thy peril through my mystic arts, so the aid could be sent. So he's the guy that just saved our ass. Now he's talking to Yellow. You found a book. Can I see it? Yellow's like, sure. Ooh, tosses him the book. He looks at the book. Dude, can't read it. It's got a picture. Now the picture is kind of like the flip of the um, of the uh, game box. The game box has you standing with one foot on the chest of a slain gargoyle, and the book has a gargoyle standing with one foot on the chest of a slain human, which is you. And it's written in a language he doesn't know. And he's like, I have no idea how to speak this. So um, why don't you take it to Mariah at the Lyceum? That's over by Moonglow. And she's the finest scribe on the Council, or the Great Council of Wizards. Which I think is supposed to be the Great Council, but I guess now they're just, they, they don't, they don't, like, they used to advise the, the government, and they were based here, but I guess they moved to Moonglow for some reason. One more thing, Avatar. I know you went through a gateway. Do you see all the stone? Yeah, I still got the stone. Oh, I wonder where it came from. Maybe the gargoyles? Why don't you ask British about it? He knows about them. Okay, let's ask British about it. Yo, British. He's like, what's up? Tell me about this stone. He's like, oh, I got one of those. You might remember. You had to you had to bring it to me. I was like, yeah. I didn't know there was more than one. All right. Uh, basically, he's going to explain how the stone works. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. So, rather than just read off what he said, I'm going to demonstrate his power, and that will be enough for now. So, we go to F1. That's me. And we're going to use the stone. So basically, you put the stone on the ground, and the position you place it is the key to unlocking its powers. Like, we're going to put it just right here, one north of me, and then we're going to step through it. Where will it take us? Well, if you know the chart, which I kind of know, it takes us to his throne room. Convenient. So now if I get hurt, which you'll notice that we're not hurt, we all got, got our, our full hit points, we're all like, yeah, and he'll heal us. Just talk to him, he'll heal us. Well, if he's here. If he's not here, then he won't. So, before we forget, excuse me, still got my hiccups. Always got my hiccups. Don't never fear. We're going to go to me, and we're going to use my key on this door. Remember, we have the key to the sewers and the castle gates. This door, because this door has both the portcullis switch and the um, little winch thing there for the, for the drawbridge. 
All right, so the castle is open to us. And then I walked into a wall. That's the sound you make when you walk into a wall. Uh, uh, uh. Our avatar's got some, uh, he's, let's just call him movement challenged. Yeah, see? There you go. All right, so that's the castle for now. And um, that's the story so far. We have to figure out what's going on with the gargoyles. we got to rescue the shrines. There are eight shrines for the eight virtues. I mentioned them, you know, the eight virtues and whatnot. Um, just to recap on them, there's compassion, there's valor, there's honesty, there's sacrifice, there's justice, there's honor, there's humility, there's um, spirituality. Those are the eight virtues. All right. And the eight virtues, of course, are awesome. And we're going to live by them. So no stealing, no lying, no being a jerk. We, you know, we're, we donate to the poor. You know, we're awesome. Ultima Five, first one I played, and it's kind of it's kind of shaped my life. I do try try to to be a, a kind of avatar-y kind of guy for the most part. So anyways, thanks for watching, and next time we will I don't know explore the rest of the castle. I guess maybe maybe take a peek into the sewers. Like I said, we gotta set we gotta set limits. We gotta have boundaries. Otherwise, we can keep going for for hours. So thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Oh, oh gotta save it. Save it right here. Save. There we go. So, peace out.